Welcome to Christoph. Time's up. Uh, thanks a lot, Kevin. Uh, thanks a lot uh, to Velox for inviting me to be here. I'm very excited to um, speak to all of you and a big congratulation to Velox. This is really impressive. I've been to a couple of Velox symposia, but the spaces get uh, more and more impressive and so does uh, the audience. It's great uh, to talk to all of you. Um, I'm also really excited to talk about this project here, the value of daylight in buildings, and it is actually about the financial va uh, value of daylight. Uh, this is something that, as a research community, we've been talking about for over 20 years. I remember the International Energy ta uh, Task 31, daylighting buildings in the 21st century. That came up again and again, and I'm glad that we started now to tackle this more in earnest. So what are we talking about? When we talk about the benefits of daylight, then I just uh, nodded down a few points here, and you've heard, of course, uh, from my colleagues at this symposium, as well as at previous symposia, why we are valuing having daylight in buildings from advanced environmental satisfaction and productivity, decreased stress level connectivity to the outside. Uh, then there comes, of course, higher prestige if you have that corner daylight office. And finally, we have energy savings as well. Uh, but, or not but, uh, one observation to make, this is mostly, and this is a good thing, um, uh, focusing on the occupants and the tenants of the buildings. But of course, we have a high number of buildings where uh, the reality is we have investors that invest in these buildings, and we still have to make, to show whether all these research that we've done over the years, all this reputation of daylighting, actually leads to the tenants paying higher rents uh, in daylit buildings if uh, we want to motivate uh, the real estate sector to work on this. So I'd be really curious, who is an architect in this room? Great, who is a sexy architect? I know there are at least a few, excellent, very good. <laughs> and Vivian, uh, do we have any real uh, uh, people from the real estate sector? Excellent, great, a few of us here as well. So I think uh, both groups will benefit what, uh, from what we are uh, presenting in the following. So what am I talking about? Usually we have both groups. We have here, in this case, in the majority, the design teams, and then we have the investors at any building. And both during the design process are obviously looking at the building with their own set of tools, right? And uh, there's a certain barrier between them. On the one hand, we don't really want to know uh, on the design team where the money is coming from, just give it to me. And then on the other hand, we have the design team that uh, looks at how to form and shape the building as efficiently as possible. And so the, the main idea behind this project here was to bring basically the two groups together. This uh, graphic is from Ilmak Turan from our lab, and I just love it. Um, and the idea here was to say we wanted to put the design performance analysis methods and the financial analysis methods together and understand these questions better. Namely, this is the group we worked with the MIT Real Estate Innovation Lab, which is led by Andrea Shigut, and on the team was uh, Ir Irmark Turan as well as uh, Daniel Fink. And we asked the question, what is the financial value of daylight in commercial spaces in Manhattan? And so more uh, specifically, if we look at anecdotal evidence, we know that we have a good chance that good access to daylight will have some value proposition, because when you look into any ad on a building, you typically see, buy my apartment, it's flooded with daylight, you have 360-degree views, so there must be something. And we even found this quote here from the New York Times from last year, where a developer says, if you have in Manhattan a view of the river, you uh, can fetch an extra $300 per square foot extra. That seems to be a little large, uh, but it just gives you a sense that the real estate uh, sector already thinks there's some value, but we wanted to provide some evidence if this is the case or not. So what we are after is this moment. We wanted to say, how do we, when is the decision being made? We want to catch the moment when this is supposed to be a real estate developer signing the lease for a commercial space. And of course, what people are paying for a commercial space depends on the num a number of things. It's the location of the space, it's how well the economy is doing, is if it's a new building, if it has um, wireless access, and uh, finally, hopefully, there's a little bit of influence as well if the space is daylit or not. 
So to answer this question and figure this out, uh, what we did, well, first from the real estate side, we used something that's called an hedonic pricing model. So this is uh, effectively a regression model where you put a number of factors in there, such as, again, location of the building, age of the building, class type of the building. And we wanted to add to these type of models something that they don't have right now, which is the uh, access to data of these individual floor plans as well. So how do we um, evaluate uh, daylight availability? Obviously, obviously, this is something that we've done a lot of research of, on a, of, as a community about. So what we're using in North America, and I understand now more and more in Europe as well, is something called spatial daylight autonomy. So what it allows us is to break an area into a daylight and a non-daylight portion. So if half of the occupied hours in the year you have more than 300 lux, we would say this is daylight and otherwise it's not. And the advantage of using this metric is that from previous work, both from the Daylighting Metrics Committee work, from the IESNA, as well as from work that we've done afterwards, that people actually, when they first visit a space and do an evaluation, this evaluation is correlated to the daylight autonomy of a space. And uh, we assume that when somebody rents a space, we have this moment, somebody visits the space and looks at it, so hopefully this metric is going to capture what this person is experiencing. So um, this is what we wanted to do. Now, this is the data set. We uh, got this from the Real Estate Innovation Lab, uh, public data sets from Manhattan. We modeled a total of over 5,000 rental spaces in Manhattan in 900 buildings. And we got the information about what people are paying in these rents from the Comstack database. So how does this then look like? The workflow was we take all the data, all the real estate data that is available, create a three-dimensional model of Manhattan, model every floor that we are interested in explicitly, and then feed the daylight autonomy results into our hedonic pricing model. So this is how this looks. This is an example building in Manhattan. This is how the Rhino model looks for this. And then here we have the spatial daylight autonomy. So in this case, it's 46%. And what this means is that half of this space has good daylighting potential. So what are our results? Well, first of all, how much daylight do we have in Manhattan in these different spaces? And what you see here is a distribution which actually shows that SDA works well as a metric here. So we had some spaces that effectively have zero daylight. And then we have some spaces that have 100% daylight autonomy which was uh, good to see. Uh, it's a little packed at this higher end, uh, and I'm going to get to that a little later. But the number to remember is that in Manhattan, daylighting is a great discriminator because three quarters of the spaces don't have good access to daylight. So probably people understand that there is a plus in there when you have good daylight. So here, these uh, slides give you a little bit of a sense what's the relationship between what people pay per floor area, how much daylight there is, and how actually the transaction floor, how high you are in the building, how this relates in different buildings. And so the first building is 450 Park Avenue. That's a relationship as you would consider. It's a, uh, it's a tower that stands a bit on its own, so it means as you go up to higher levels, people pay more and the daylighting uh, goes up. The next building shows you this is not always the case. This is in Hanover Square in Manhattan. And there you see effectively, even if you go up by floor level and you get access to more daylight, actually the rent stays the same. And then we have some cases where this is a very deep floor plan building. So effectively, it doesn't matter on which floor you are, the amount of daylight that you have constantly stays the same. So these are all different relationships, and that was important for us to understand because we were deeply hoping that the floor level itself would not be enough of an indicator to tell you how much daylight you have. And so this is the slide that summarizes all uh, the work that we've been doing, and we're trying here with some graphics to make this hedonic model more accessible to you. So what are the parameters that matter? And the two at the top are most important. So they tell you that if you have a space with good access to daylight, daylight autonomy either over 55% or over 75%, your rent uh, that you can get goes up by 5 to 6%. So that's a statistically significant number. What, of course, you see in the next line is the effect that, for example, location have. So everybody knows location, location, location. Depending on where you are in Manhattan, that's a bigger effect overall. Not surprising. And the next big number is actually the year when the rental contract was signed, because this goes with economic cycles up and down. 
So as a summary, um, what can you take from this presentation? So we uh, suggest with these numbers that if a space has a spatial daylight autonomy of over 55%, you can expect a rent premium in a dense urban area of about 5%. So what are some caveats to all the simulations? Uh, well, here we only based the whole analysis based on spatial daylight autonomy. We didn't use any view metrics, partly because there are no good view metrics available, but also just to get going. This was a quite complicated simulation process. Uh, this is something that we want to tackle next. We also, in terms of our models, assumed a 30% window-to-wall ratios in all orientation. This is something that we're changing right now to be more true to the actual window-to-wall ratios and materials. And then finally, we didn't know the interior floor plans, so we assumed basically no interior partitions, no shading device use, so this is the daylighting potential of a space. And our justification was for that, for, that for these pretty high-end commercial spaces, people would do a new fit-out anyhow after they rent the space. So what's the significant? Well, we've shown that there is an effect. So if you have more daylight in a space, dense urban settings such as Manhattan, you are uh, creating a value with having daylighting in there. Um, we think on the one hand this is good for the real estate sector because 5 to 6 percent is something that provides a long-term uh, value that can be captured here. But it's, uh, I think, even more important for this audience if you use these numbers that provides you agency as architects. If the next time your client is complaining that your windows are too expensive, that you can use this information and really point out that uh, the value that you are creating to this building just with daylighting is probably higher than your overall fee. And with that, uh, I thank you.